I just uh, first want to just say uh, thank you to Pastor Gene and this church for your guys' kindness to me. And um, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a miracle we made it. You know, uh, I, you know I've, we've just been going through so much lately. I didn't even know if we were going to be able to make it. And then not only we made it, but some people from our church made it, which it's just mercy and grace. And uh, meeting like this, you know, uh, most of my uh, favorite preachers are in this room. So that's who I'm going to target today. <laughs> and I pastor the Nowhere Baptist Church of Nowhere in California. So I, I, know, I know who I am. I'm nothing. Amen. So if anything comes out of this message for you, you're going to know that it came from nobody <laughs> and that it was actually the Lord. Um, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for your mercy and grace. Just pray you, you use this message, God, to encourage somebody here. And uh, just move me out of the way, please, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, open up your Bible to Luke chapter 8. I thought I was going to say John 3.16, didn't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, Matthew's funny. Um, as you're opening there, um, I just want to start delineating something that, uh, you know, uh, I've been in the ministry for a little while. And, you know, as I'm looking around this room, man, I'm, I'm like new on the block. I'm new, and uh, but in the short time I have uh, been around, I've learned a couple things. And I've learned that there is a time that everyone serving the Lord has to go through something. And uh, Mays Jackson famously said, "You are either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or going into a storm." So uh, let's look at Luke chapter 8, if you wouldn't mind standing to read the Word of God, amen? amen. Let's read a few verses. We're going to start in verse 22. We're in Luke chapter 8, verse 22. It says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship and with his disciples. And he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and filled with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he uh, rose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased. And there was a calm, and he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and water. Amen. Amen. And they obey him. You may be seated. I'm like, man, I hope I can get through this. Man, someone's been praying for this service. <laughs> it's, I'm feeling something back here. I won't start speaking in tongues, Brother Walker. <laughs> Um, in, in our text, we find a storm dispensationally. We all have to understand that there is coming a storm, uh, a, a storm of trials and of testing into your life. If, if you might just uh, give me the, uh, just come with me for a little. I don't, I don't speak proper. I'm going to try just because I like you guys. But the guys at my church say no. <laughs> but, um, Come with me. Come on. Come on now. Um, you know what? You guys have your little lark in charge. <laughs> Amen? So what are you talking about? In life, you're going to come through a little dispensation called storms and trials. And you're going to come through it. Now, uh, it's been said well yesterday that there are points in Jesus' life that as we saw him go through, that the follower of the Lord will have to endure just the same. Now, for instance, as a Christian, you're going to have your wedding at Cana. It was a good day. Wow, God showed up, did something miraculous. Wow, amen. 
That's like your wedding in Canaan. You'll have your baptism, per se. The Lord will look upon you saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. It's a, it's a type. It's a type. Um, you'll have the time where you're betrayed by one of your closest. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and all are scattered, leaving you through a cruel trial of mocking and scourging. It's just a type. Now, uh, what, what came next? The crucifixion? That's you. I'm going to get through this thing. <laughs> But we understand here, not understanding dispensations will cripple the teacher of the Bible. It's going to cripple you. You, you are going to rest your own destruction. You, I've seen it happen. I've been subject to that kind of teaching. Me. And, um, but just like not understanding dispensations, rightly dividing, uh, not under, in, understanding the dispensation of suffering in your life, will cripple your ability to comfort the suffering. I... Now, uh, I go street preaching, but remember, I'm nobody. I go street preaching because I should be dead. I'm, I'm just figuring, what, what's the quickest way I can make up for lost time? That's me. But we had a guy come up to me with a pentagram on his shirt. And uh, he looked like one of my old buddies. And uh, he's telling me how he was molested in a church. And it all made more sense after that. I get it. I understand what you're saying. Now, I'm not saying I get it. I've never had to be through something like, go through something like that. But uh, he said, you know, if God was real, why would I have gotten molested in a church? And what are you going to say to that? Well, we, our church has already talked about it. But all I said was, you know what? Why would God have to send Daniel into the lion's den? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. You went through something. I understand. God understands you went through something. But maybe God wants to use it for somebody else. So, uh, I'm gunning for you preachers, believe it or not. I'm gunning for you preachers care, pain and hurt. Uh, Remember that old hymn, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Amen. Amen. So we're going to find a few things. Uh, I'm going to title this uh, lesson, uh, Lessons from the Storm. Lessons from the Storm. So come over to Luke chapter 8 and verse 22. What do we find? Certainty with the Savior. It says, now it came to pass on a certain day. Now it was a certain day. Now there's never a good time to get certain phone calls. There's never a good time to get certain news. It's just never a good time. But with certainty, you, we, we have certainty with the Savior, amen? And um, without, I mean, kind of go back in, in your mind for just a moment, without those certain days that showed up at certain times that there was no good time for, you would not be here today, probably. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe some of you, it's a jail sentence. Maybe some of you, it's a divorce. Maybe some of you, it's a, who knows? I mean, some very hard tragedy that, guess what? You wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that tragedy. It was a certain day, and certainly it was a day of purpose. You uh, heard a preacher, he watched uh, as a master knife thrower through knife strategically around his assistant, just going inches away from the individual and never hitting him. And the preacher says, God, I pray I never preach like that. Amen? 
But certainly it was a day of purpose. You know, when, when, you, when you got hit with that thing, God said, you know, it's not going to hit the hand. It's not going to hit the foot. It's going to hit the heart. Right where I need it to hit. And, uh, and certainly it was a day of pain. Amen? Certainly. We have certainty with the Savior. So certainly it was a day of pain. What would Noah have been without ever going through a flood? What would uh, David have been without ever meeting a giant? What would Daniel have been without ever going into a lion's den? What would Joseph have ever been without being thrown into a pit? Genesis chapter 15, verse 20. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. I just want you to see something here. Joseph in the Old Testament, one of the greatest types of Christ you'll find in the Bible, he says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. But it doesn't stop there. To bring to pass as of this day, to save much people alive. I can't say that I actually understand how he ever got to that point. I'm just being honest. That was a mighty act of God that he could ever come to that realization. But back in our text, Luke chapter 8, so we understand it's a certain day. And what, what do we find on that certain day is certain disciples. Now, this title, disciple, is an honor. It's an honor to be called a disciple. Uh, there's offices of honor in this world, but because they came with a great cost, they are titles of honor. Maybe you'd say pastor, maybe you'd say uh, evangelist, priest, or on the worldly side of things, soldier. You see what I'm saying? Uh, why are these uh, classified as honors? Because there's a sacrifice that goes with it. Now, um, that individual uh, fulfilling that role is paying the price like a police officer. Right? Supposedly a police officer is supposed to be going out there and serve. He's willing to take a bullet for you if he needs to. Uh, and that's why it's an honorable position. Now, um, there is a price to being a disciple. So last night, uh, Brother Fernandez brought up that not every Christian is following the Lord. I'm going to add on top of that, not every Christian is a disciple. They're not paying the price. They're not paying the price. Now, you, you think of the word disciple, what's in that word discipline? It means a direct neglect of things that other people live for. Oh, you don't? Uh, no, no, I don't do that. Well, how about? Uh, no, I don't do that either. What, what do you do? Since you brought it up, later today we're actually going to go yeah. <laughs> stand outside and yell at people. <laughs> but um, you think about that, this, uh, discipline is there in that word. Uh, at our church we have kind of a running joke. It's a neglect of pleasures of this world, also uh, an often neglect of me time. That's our running joke of the church. Oh, you having some me time today? Okay. Uh, it's loving the unlovable. It's caring for the uncareable. I'm making a new dictionary. Uh, being a disciple is only a select few in the church today. Matthew 8, 23, it says, and he, uh, when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. So who brought him into that ship? Jesus. Amen. That's called the perfect will of God. Now, uh, as we kind of continue moving on here, uh, there's different classifications of disciples, right? I mean, the reader of the Bible, you, you understand that. In uh, Acts 1, there's the 120. Luke 10, there's the 70. Then there's the 12, there's the 3, and then the 1. The one that Jesus loved. John. Amen? So, uh, what's all that mean? you're going to decide which group you're in. And it will be your decision. 
See, Jesus wants you to be in the group that's the one, yeah. where you neglect all. But the fact is, everybody doesn't make it there. I would venture to say most people will never make it there because they're not willing to what? Pay the price. They're not willing to pay the price to be a disciple. 2 Timothy 3.12, I'll read it. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now that's for doing right, not for stupidity. Right? Oh, well, maybe your whole hardship is just because you're an idiot. Don't blame that on God. Now, uh, following Jesus, you will go through a storm at some time. Guaranteed. That's the direction, which is our third thing I'm looking at. You know, we, we got a, a certain day with certain disciples in a certain... Verse 22, it says, let us go over onto the other side of the lake. He tells you exactly where we're going. Amen. I like that. You know, I, I like getting somewhere and be like, Gene, uh, where do you want me? He's like, I don't know. Get out of here. I'm like, man, I'm really confused. You know, do I put a mic on? Do I, I'll just hand out some shirts, I guess, you know. You know, but I, I like showing up somewhere and they're like, look, it's going to be this, this, this. Hey, my, my, my uh, people at my church will tell you, brother, you're doing better than Randy normally does. <laughs> You're actually closer to being on time than we normally start, but oh, God's grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord. So what do we have with Jesus? We have a certain direction. Now, it will be a trip, your Christian walk, a trip that has a definite and specific purpose and plan that only the Lord knows. What? Your storm. Your storm. As that physician starts to pull out those tools, he knows what each one is going to be for. Guess what? I need this one. Yeah, I need this one. Oh, that's a sharp one. Yeah, it is. Well, I got to use it here in a second. You'll see what I'm cutting. You know, and you're, you're sitting there like, you're going to put me out, right? He's like, no, actually, I'm going to sleep in the bottom of the boat while this surgery is going on. Amen? Amen. <laughs> well, that doesn't make me feel comfortable, Jesus. <laughs> but it's a certain direction. Uh, like, the, like the old hymn says, I only designed thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Why would you bring that up? It says, I only design. It's with a specific intention. Uh, you know, and uh, I guess a little side note here. I'm going to run a rabbit just for a moment. John 6, 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You're either going to get on the boat or not. Some Christians won't get on the boat. Jesus is like, no, we're going to go over there. I'm going to get this better. I'm going to fix it. Give me that little key to that little room in the back of your heart that you don't want to tell no one about, and I'll clean it up. Thanks anyway, Jesus. I'll wait here. Okay, then you'll get parked. That's right. And you will have a dispensation in your life called the wilderness. Now, uh, you could sit up here and say whatever you want, but when you've tasted it, I'm not just up here saying things. Uh, you want to make some bad decisions. Uh, you, you want to uh, avoid that ship and that trip, uh, then you're going to be said tripping. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Luke 8, 23. So we found first certainty with the Savior. Next we found jeopardy with the Savior in verse 23. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. What's jeopardy? I had to go to a dictionary because I don't even, I just think Alex, Alex Trebek. Yeah. You know, that's how worldly I am. So I have to go to an old dictionary. What is jeopardy? Exposure to death. They were in jeopardy with Jesus in the same boat. God loves you. Come on. That's, I, I, I honestly feel that that uh, type of thinking has crept into our churches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you rightly divide, you're slamming the your King James Bible, and when something bad comes into your life, for some reason you're thinking, this can't be God. <laughs> and, um, 
I want you to notice first, the storm came down. What's up, heaven? (laughs) The Lord. The storm came down. We know every word of God is pure, and uh, this stuff is not just put in here just randomly. And we're not going to run to the Greek and say, oh, oh, better rendering. (laughs) Well, I prefer a more formal equivalent. Uh, uh, No, it says the storm came down. The storm came down. Now, we might not want to admit where the storm came from. Through what you're going through, I don't know. Some, something to do with it. Now, somebody here unsaved, which I would be. Oh, Jesus Christ is their Savior. You're not even on the boat. You're still on the shore. You're just watching the whole story. Uh, actually, we're going to find out you're on the other side of the lake. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but why would God send this storm to those that follow him, that love him, that serve him? They've left everything for him. I'm looking at missionaries, pastors, preachers, street preachers, Sunday school teachers. Why do you have these problems? Read a couple verses, Psalm 119.71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. That I might look, learn thy statutes. Psalm 23, verse 4, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Huh? A rod and a staff? Oh, yeah, they come. Oh, yeah, I just run them through my hair. You know, they just make me feel so good. But if you be without chastisement, you're a bastard. Thy rod and thy staff. You know what? The reason why you're going through the storm is because you are a son. Because you are on the right path. And, you know, my wife, uh, well, we talk about, you know, uh, for a Christian, this is as worse as it's going to get. Right here. And by, by the looks of some of you, you ain't doing too bad. <laughs> Amen? Right. Amen? You know, and uh, so, yeah, you're going through a storm. But, I mean, I, I wonder if we just cross the, the seas, what their storms look like compared to yours. Yeah. <laughs> I was unfriended. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe it? Or Gene always calling me, I lost a subscriber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gene, I'll resubscribe. <laughs> just joking. Just joking. Just joking. Now, obviously, he's not losing subscribers. <laughs> I think he, hic- he hiccuped my name in, in, in one of his videos, and we got like 100 subscribers within three hours. I'm like... <laughs> So I was like, man, I hope I don't screw him up. <laughs> but uh, what, what do we find? We find that, that we find jeopardy with the Savior. We looked at the storm came down. What was it? A storm of wind? Think about this. I heard a new phrase lately. It's called a breathitarian. What's that mean? I don't even know, but I'm going to use it for my application. It's a storm of wind. Hot air. It's a storm. That hot air starts to flow from who? Windbags. <laughs> Those windbags, they start, <laughs> and that hot air begins to flow. You know, uh, we're at our church. We're going through First Samuel, and uh, I've said this before, but Hannah, she went all the way to the house of God with her adversary, breathing down her neck the whole time. What was it? Hot air. Oh, Hannah, you can't have a baby? Oh, see all my little, little kids? Aren't they cute? Oh, oh, one day, one day, sis. One day, oh, there'll be, never be a day for you. <laughs> and where did they go? The house of God. What did she find? Hot air. In the house of God. From who? Windbags. <laughs> Okay, I guess we'll get off that one. <laughs> Can I turn 
actually call you names and get away <laughs> anyway but what what was there a storm of water storm of water so storm of wind storm of water elijah uh, 12 barrels of water were poured on his sacrifice, and yet it still burned. Amen? Um, God was faithful to receive that sacrifice because Elijah was being led by God. So guess what? Sometimes when you put your sacrifice on the altar and you are actually following God, that water begins to be poured all over your little sacrifice. And you're like, man, this is how am I ever going to do a sacrifice like this? And those brethren are like, <laughs> you know, are those local uh, Pentecostal pastors? <laughs> you know, uh, you guys don't deal with those. You know, uh, yeah, Noah had the heavens flood his earth, and still he was found floating on the waters. And he was protected by the Lord the whole time because the Lord shut the door. Now, uh, Moses was sent down a river in a basket sealed with pitch, but he was still greatly used by God. You know, uh, you think about that. Just bring that down to personal application. My mom kicked me out when I was just an infant. I'm never going to forget her. God ain't real. Moses could have done that. He was sent down the, the river. Literally. Literally. See, you you weren't. <laughs> hey, you, maybe you were spanked a little too much. Hey, I don't know. I don't know your situation. But what I'm saying is uh, God can still use you. And God will still use you when you give him what you got. But your problem is you won't give him what you got. Why? Could, maybe you're holding the grudge. But what, what's your point, Randy? A Christian who is in the ship with Jesus Christ will go through a storm. The Savior went down. So we look, the storm came down. Then the Savior went down. God must be uh, allowing these things into your life for what? A purpose. For a purpose. Well, I don't see the purpose. Amen. You may never. You may never. Uh, you think about a past pur purpose. It reminds me of Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time. What's it? Right on time. In due time. Christ died for the ungodly. Thank you, Lord. You know, uh, man, I, I could do a whole nother message on that. Uh, you just think about where you were before you got saved. And in due, in due time, Christ just arranged those situations to just drive your knees so deep into that dirt, you know, to get those tears finally flowing. You know, those, those things don't run. Didn't, they weren't running very good. You know, and, and he just he just... He just uh, lit up that little pilot light. He turned up that thing. And, oh, they just started flowing. Oh, Jesus, I'll do anything. I'll be a missionary to Chile. <laughs> and then he remembers what you said. <laughs> Did I say Chile? <laughs> but you think about the Savior went down to sleep. He, sh he showed up for your past. What about your present? For now we see through a, gla a glass darkly. You're in a storm. So you're, you're looking at your storm and you're like, I don't see the point. I don't see, I don't see the purpose. It says, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall even also, I can't even read. Even as also I am known. So what's the point? Right now you don't see why you're in this storm. You will. You'll know why one day. I may be... Tomorrow, maybe later today, maybe be in eternity. Uh, what about the future? The future, First Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So what's the point? Humble yourselves, therefore. What's that there for? <laughs> what, what, what are you talking about, Randy? Look, if he's shown himself faithful in the past, and he's shown himself faithful in the present, you made it here, didn't you? I bet some of you even ate breakfast. <laughs> Amen. Amen? But he's shown himself faithful in the past, faithful in the present. What makes you think he ain't going to be faithful tomorrow? Amen. You're sitting there looking at your message, and you're like, man, these people don't even listen to me anymore. 
You're sitting there getting ready for street preaching. What's all this even worth? No, no one's going to get saved out there. And the devil's like, ah, the hot air, you know, the hot hot air. You start, man, you start thinking about what the brethren in the hot air is coming from. They're like, and, and you know what? Jesus is like, go anyway. Because now I know it's a sacrifice. Uh, I street preach. And it's not because I'm anything or anybody. Like I said, I'm just trying to make up for lost time. But the fact is, being dispensational here, you understand there's not going to be a revival? And you still choose to go street preaching? You, un- you understand that, guess what? Maybe no one will get saved. You still go. You still hand that person the track. You still street preach. You still pray for your family. You still keep going and going and going. Why? Because now it's a real sacrifice. Amen. You, know, you know, with some Baptists, you may, you may know some of them. I sure do. They cannot attach to the ministry huge results. So when you bring up this idea that there will not be an end time revival uh, and you're accused of heresy uh, from the local church in my city, um, it's documented. It is documented. Buy Jane's book. Buy his book. Uh, It's documented. But when you're accused of heresy and yet you still go out, you know, they start looking at you. They're like, man, these beat up bloodied, yeah. bruised. I mean, look look at that mess of an individual. And he still keeps going. Yeah. Hey. Why? Because you're Lord. You came to the end of your rope somewhere, amen? Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. if you've not come to the end of your rope, that's what the storm's designed for. Yeah. That storm is designed to break you. So we, what do we see? We see, thirdly, the authority of the Savior in Luke 8, 24. It says, And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind, the hot air, and the raging of the water, and they seized. And there was a calm. So what do we see? The Savior's authority awoke. God acts largely based upon the prayers of the saints. Maybe you're not seeing it because you're not asking for it. I'm not talking about lining your uh, pockets with money. I mean, otherwise, man, I'd, I'd be pretty rich right now. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> but what am, I, what am I talking about is this. Um, they came to him on that boat. Did you notice the order, how they came to him? Now, I understand there's a beautiful song Brother Rex Harris sings, He Came to Me. And, hey, I get the application. But you have to be willing to come to the Lord. Now, the types of type of Christianity we deal with today is this. I was thinking about jumping over. I can't jump on that thing, by the way. I, that that used to be my thing, right there. But uh, you know, I, I can get on there and uh, I can start playing a little rhythm, and I can say, "Come on, Jesus, come on." Ding ding ding. You know, I, I could do all that. And guess what? Jesus is like, no, you got to come to me. Okay, hey, you're playing with your little toy. When you're ready to mean business, you come to me. Amen? Now, these disciples of the Lord went to him. And uh, they didn't tell the Lord, hey, follow me as, as I continue the way I was raised. What, what do you mean? No, I, I heard that from a Christian recently. Oh, this is just the way I was raised. Okay, well, if you were raised stupid, would you say stupid? <laughs> Amen? I mean, I think there's probably something that your parents bestowed upon thy head that your parents would be like, get rid of that. You know, I mean, uh, whatever's good, keep, and whatever's junk, get rid of it, man. You know, uh... I was just raised out. That's an excuse. That's an excuse. And uh, you know what? They didn't have to tell the Lord, oh, if I can find time in my busy schedule, maybe you can come along in the boat with me. And if I could find time to spend some time with you and talk with you, uh, maybe if, if I have time. And God has a weird way of making time out of your behind. 
Amen. Hey, you want some time? Okay, hey. You know, uh, God could just flick something in your life and you'll never work again. He just flicks it. Just piece of cake. Permanently disabled. Uh, God has his ways and he's jealous, amen? But uh, we see that the Savior's authority awoke. They came to him. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Pastor, preacher, missionary, friend. You got stuff hanging over your head. You got something hard. You're sitting in a storm, and you need to go to Jesus. You know, it doesn't say they went to each other frantically going, Brother Walker, what do we do? It's, it's like, I, I don't, okay, this is the way I think. They were probably just like looking at each other and went. <laughs> they all went down to see Jesus. Just come with me for a moment. All right? Oh, well, I don't see how doctrinally. Just come with me. Get the picture. They went to Jesus, okay? They, they came physically. You know, there's places that you physically need to be. Flip side, there's places that you physically should not be. Amen? And, and there's, there's times and places that you need to be there. Now, I don't know how many people were supposed to be here who are not here. But, uh, you know, maybe God wanted somebody here that they said, you know, I'm not going to physically be where God wants me to be. All right? And whatever that is. But, you know, uh, they came spiritually. They came in prayer. Some of you, um, some of you might just have your thank you for the food prayers, but a real storm comes into your life. Uh, a real storm of humbling and pain and hurt. Uh, God has a way of having you to call upon him in true prayer, but through the dispensation of a storm. Um, what do we see? The Savior's authority arose. See, it wasn't just uh, the authority awoke. The authority arose. The Savior arose. And we just sang that, didn't we? <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, but when, he, when his authority arose, when that Savior arose, it changed everything. You know, uh, uh, John MacArthur, uh, as uh, Brother Walker delineates his little track, I have a couple if, if you want one, but um, uh, John MacArthur will park the car and say, oh, it's the powers in the depth, the powers in the depth. No, no, no. <laughs> the powers when he arose. Yeah. Death was all part of the agreement. Uh, anybody can die. Anybody can die. Everybody will die. You know, 100% of people will die. <laughs> Those statistics are mind-boggling. <laughs> but Jesus arose. That's what makes him different. Uh, I'm just going to throw it just because I like to make people irritated. The Savior's authority assuaged. What's that? That's a King James word, sucker. Amen. Read your Bible. Go to Genesis 8. 8. 8. You change this word, you're changing a cross reference. Genesis 8. Go to Genesis 8. You know, where are we at? In our, in our text, we're in a storm, aren't we? There's water there. What do we find in Genesis 8? Water. <laughs> and, and what does God do with the water? Uh, let's say Genesis 8 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all that house into the ark. For the, uh, I'm in 7. Turn it here. And God remembered Noah. You need to remember that, preacher. God remembered Noah. Ain't he going to remember you? Amen. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. That was some stormy waters, I think. Uh, I kind of like what destroyed the whole earth. I, I would call that I would venture to say that was a little storm. And, and guess what? Those waters assuaged. I need an, an A anyway. But might as well just use a King James word just to make somebody irritated. Just, eh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they're going to change that word. And they're going to change the meaning when they change that word. You change the word, you change the meaning. Now, 
Jesus is in the water calming business. That's what he is. He's in the water calming business. And uh, you might be looking around to your little Facebook friends. You might be looking around to your little prescription drugs. Uh, you might be looking around to your old friends, your old ways. And uh, you need to get back to the old paths. He's in the water calming business. And though you find yourself in the midst of a storm, remember who's in the boat. Remember who's in the boat. You know, uh, I think i got like two more minutes. Um, when the Jews were in the wilderness, uh, they, they kept telling Moses, hey, man, it would have been better if we just died in Egypt. No, it would have been better for you to die with honor in the wilderness. It would have been better for you to die with honor in the midst of your storm. <laughs> With honor. Um, so we looked at the certainty with the Savior, the jeopardy with the Savior, the authority of the divinity of the Savior, found in verse 25, Luke 8, 25, and he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. I am reminded how our sinless Savior knelt down in a garden that was not a bed of roses. He watered that soil, not with a flower pitcher, but with his sinless tears, making his sinless prayer and, and sinless supplication to the Lord to let this cup pass from him. And with perfect faith, sealing that prayer with the words, nevertheless, not my word. this man to a cross that would kill him. Uh, also, uh, also he could raise from the dead, conquering death, hell, and sin for you. It was all for a purpose in his life. So now we look back at us. It's all for a purpose in your life. Now I'm sorry I can't give you the purpose. I'll tell you what it is. Half the stuff going on in my life, I don't know what it's for. But I know who's in the boat. And as long as you can guarantee he's in the boat, you're in the right spot. Um, two more things. The purpose might have been someone else altogether. Now, uh, look at, or I'll just read this. Mark 4.36 uh, this is a parallel reference to Luke 8. It says, When they had sent away the multitude, they took him, uh, even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. Those other little ships are other little Christians. Watching how Pastor Gene is going to handle this one, how Pastor Walker is going to handle this one, how the missionary is going to handle this one, how some godly parents are going to handle this one. There are other little ships, and they're sending their little... You okay? You okay? SOS. <laughs> Looks like you're in a storm. How you handling? Some little ships. And then at the end of our text here, Luke 8, 27, what do we find on the other side of that journey? And when he went forth to a land, there met him out of uh, the city a certain man which had devils a long time. <laughs> now, I can't give you all the reasons, and there's brethren in here that probably could, but all I know is this trip was just for one man. Adoniram Judson lost two wives while being a faithful missionary. So you can see how it's done. As he's sitting in prison, looking at those open boils, probably, I mean, sleepless nights, laying in the dirt. You have no idea what prison is, buddy. That's a real prison. And that guy's sitting there like, you think he's mad at God? You know, I, I, I don't know him personally. I've read about him, but all I know is when, when he got out, he just jumped right back on to doing the Bible. He's like, I'm going to do that Bible. If it kills me, I'm going to do this Bible. 
And uh, George Whitfield, if I understand right, he preached until the candle went out, and then he died. So you would know how to do it. Verse 20 is right there. So what are you saying? Amen. It's good to rightly divide. Amen. It's good to understand all that stuff. You know, you need it. You need it to help your family, to help your church. Uh, preachers, you need it, but you need to understand and rightly divide the dispensation of the suffering that you're going through right this second. And it's for a purpose. I know you don't believe me, so let's look at what Joseph said again. Genesis 50 and verse 20. And he says this, But as for you, you thought evil against me. And maybe some of the brethren have. Maybe uh, some of your family members have. Maybe they just did whatever they did, said whatever they did, really just to, just to kick the stilts out from under you. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day. And never forget this, to save much people alive. Brother Gene. The bad news is I took the wrong medication. The good news is, is that... Uh, I'm protected from heartworms and fleas for the next four months. <laughs> and uh, so I thank God for those kind of things. I, uh, I spent the first night at this hotel, and I, I, don't, I want to thank Brother Kim for putting this on. Thank you. God bless you, brother. Good to see everybody here. And uh, what a conglomeration of uh, nationalities we got here. It's just wonderful. I'm happy to uh, see all you different people. And uh, thank you, Brother Ken. I, I, uh, that place I spent the night, uh, last night, it was just wonderful. I, uh, it was on the eighth floor. I even called up Pastor Kim. I said, man, that's wonderful. I, I, I got there, opened up in blinds, and the lights were all out there. And um, I woke up early this morning. I wanted to watch the sun come up. And uh, the mountains were just all around. It was just beautiful, you know. And uh, the Lord reminded me, he said, son, I, uh, are you going to a place going to put this out of business? You know, uh, you better know, man, gonna, uh, I like California. I like being out here because the, uh, there's so, just so many people and uh, just real uh, happy about that. Um, I, I like hiking. Uh, I like getting out in the wilderness. And uh, I, I preach like a fat woman getting into a tub of water, brother. I kind of, kind of inch in. I can't, I can't just disappear and start. That, um, so I got me a couple of books and uh, wanted to read about it. Had a cup found out, a couple of people died, and uh, they fell off from the mountain and all that stuff. So I got me a book to read about it. And in that book, they had a picture uh, of, I don't know how he got in there. He must have been something, but he was a Baptist preacher, and his name was Elkanah Lamb. Um, Lamb, L A M B with a B. Elkanah Lamb. And the caption under the picture said, uh, that he was known for his long, amen, for long, fiery sermons. And I thought, man, what a thing to put in a, in a, in, in a, a tourist book for somebody to want to wanna come there. And I thought, man, that's what I like. I like long. The uh, Bible said Paul was long preaching. And uh, everybody, I had a guy who uh, went to my church for a couple when I was pastoring, and, and he was one of these guys. I, I look, I was looking last night. <laughs> I, I look at my watch, you know, but I'm sneaky about it, you know what I mean? I, I kind of like, you know, I kind of want to look to see how much longer I got to do this. And, um, uh, <laughs> but um, this guy was like this, you know, he's sitting out here in the congregation, you know, with the, with the watch. And, uh, and I thought, you know what, I'm, uh, he's trying to get out. And brethren, I'm not trying to get out. I'm trying to get 
in. I, I want to I wanna get in, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer than 30 minutes to get in. And uh, thank God, I, I'm not trying to get out. But um, I, anyway, that's Elkina Lamb. That's that piece of paper. Uh, but um, <laughs> I thought, uh, I'll, we'll get to this in just a minute, but uh, uh, God gave me something here, uh, just a little, uh, I don't get big, long stuff, uh, but, but God gives me little things when I'm reading the Bible. And I think it's of the utmost importance. Brethren, there is nothing more important in this life. There is nothing of more importance. And you don't get anything else out of this entire meeting with all of these great preachers and all of this wonderful singing. If you don't get anything, just know this. The most important thing in your life is your personal relationship with God. Not your grandkids. You know, you get to be my age. You know, you can't wait to mess with them and spoil them and give them back to parents. Uh, and uh, not the grandkids, not, the, not, not your parents, not your spouse. You better get a close walk with God. And get in there. Don't let anything get in the way of that. Nobody, no thing, nothing. And uh, it, it, sometimes it, uh, you go to bed at night, and uh, I was talking to Brother Tom. He drove me in, and... Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, brethren, you go to bed at night and uh, um, I lay my head down on the pillow and, uh, and I thought, uh, the thought comes to me, man, you didn't read your Bible. And it's possible, you know, to do that. And uh, you ought to be reading five chapters a day of your Bible. Anything less than that, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Um, uh, uh, that's right. Uh, pa uh, uh, well, I won't tell you about him. Uh, but uh, you got to get up. You, brother, you've got to go through these perfunctory things uh, to keep yourself alive for God. You're not going to come in church uh, one day a week and get, get filled up on God and you think it's going to last you all week long until you go uh, come back the next week. It's just not going to happen. Uh, when I was a Roman Catholic, I got saved at 30 years old, preacher. And uh, we had a bunch of, uh, I went to church one once, Sunday morning, took the little cookie, you know, and uh, uh, did all of that. Uh, and, um, and then I went out, and, and we got drunk that night, went to confession, did, I did all that. And, uh, but I, uh, I, I was amazed, that's all we ever did as Roman Catholics. We went to church one day a week, took the cookie, and then we went out and did what we felt like. And uh, brethren, uh, I've been saved now some 45 uh, years, and that's what I see Baptist people doing now. You like that? We're like that. Maybe not everybody here, uh, but I'm sure I felt it going in to somebody. <laughs> uh, and if, and if you will if you just realize, brother, it's, it, you're either going to get in or you're going to get out. Yeah, and uh, they had a, uh, they had a, uh, a bunch of preachers were talking, and and um, they asked the guy, said, "Well, are you in?" And uh, he said, "Yes, I am. I'm in this thing all the way up to my ankles." And the guy, <laughs> the guy said, "Well, that that's not very deep." And uh, he said, "Yeah, but I went head first. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so that's good. And maybe, uh, brethren, let me give you this, and then I'll, I'll, uh, we'll try to preach to you. Uh, but it may be of the utmost importance uh, for us um, to continuously put ourselves into these situations where we're uncomfortable. I, I hate uh, normal, normal stuff. Uh, you go to the grocery store, what do they say? Have a nice day. And if you're not careful, you, you'll say, oh, you too, have a nice day. And uh, I hate that. I don't like that. I like that in, uh, in Christians either. I don't like it. We're very, very comfortable being normal. We want to know what's going on. And that ain't where you're going to be comfortable with the Lord Jesus Christ because he's tricky, man. you gotta, you got to look out for him. Um, uh, uh, what these uncomfortable situations cause is for you uh, to have to pray more. 
You're saying, Lord, I, you get up in the morning, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, that's why I like street preaching. Uh, we pray our little perfunctory prayer. God, thank you for uh, this. Uh, brother, pray for us, and uh, God bless the preacher. God, and that's good. I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but what, I could almost say it before you say it. And, um, and, and you ought to have more of a heart uh, uh, for the Lord. Uh, we have repeatedly, as Christian myself, uh, we have repeatedly done the same activity over and over and over. Say, well, what's the matter with that? Uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, I know, but, but we get accustomed to not needing God on the scene. <laughs> We, we can do it, Lord. I got it now. I can handle it. Don't worry about it. I've done this so many times that I don't need... Well, you, we're not saying that, but that's what we imply. Now, I'm a street preacher, and I like that. I like that better than this. And um, um, I poll, and I got a banner. And I go with other preachers sometimes. We go downtown Chicago, or we go down to Kansas, wherever I'm at, and they're having a good time. They're talking, and they're laughing, and they're having a wonderful time. I'm scared to death. Forty years. Never get over it. I, I, uh, I'm praying. I said, God, kill me. Do something. I've got nothing to tell these people, God. I can't preach. I don't know what I'm doing. don't know what I'm saying. God, for God's sakes, would you help me please, Lord? Wreck the car, I don't feel like going down there. And uh, then I get my banner, and I'm walking to the corner, and I got my banner, and I got my pole, and, uh, and I'm thinking, Heavenly Father, for God's sakes, would you give me something to say to these people, please? Um, I, got, I roll the banner out. I take the, I said this to somebody, I take and put that pole together, and I get down there and put the pole up in that banner, and I'm thinking, for Lord, please, I, I, I don't have anything without you. And I take that banner and I pull it up. Yes. And as soon as that banner's up, man, it's all gone. It's all gone. Now, now I'm ready to talk to somebody. So we need to be in a panic that the Holy Ghost of God would not show up. Lord, are you going to let me do this on my own? Because I might just well go home. And we need to be in a panic that the Holy Ghost won't show up <laughs> and, uh, and pray. Now, uh, uh, the brethren, let me, I, I just need to reiterate it. Nothing is more important in this life than your personal relationship with God. I don't care what it takes. I don't care if I... Uh, Sam said uh, church people need to read their Bible 10 chapters a day. Good Lord, I can't do that, man. <laughs> Preachers are supposed to read it 20, 20 chapters a day. Man, that's a tall order, brother. <laughs> I can't do it. All right, uh, Luke uh, chapter... <sighs> well, glad I got that off of my chest. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to get that stuff off. It's my time. i got 45 minutes. I'll say whatever I want to say. Um, Luke in chapter number 22. and uh, whew, See if I can catch my breath and up. Um, Luke uh, 22 and verse 34. And, the, and here's Jesus Christ. He's talking to Peter. And he, he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Uh, for brevity, let me go down to verse uh, 60. <clears throat> and Peter had, uh, he's already denied the Lord uh, once or twice. Verse 60 says, and Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew, and the Lord turned. Boy, I, this, this verse just tears me up, you know. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Heard. 
just turned around and looked at him. Can you imagine that? I like I like when uh, when Mary didn't recognize the Lord and and uh, uh, after he rose from the dead and he uh, he he just looked at her and said, Mary. <laughs> We're going to hear our name one day, uh, uh, people. We're going to go up and uh, uh, 22. But um, and the Lord turned, verse 61, and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, uh, how he had said unto him, uh, Before the cock crow, uh, thou shalt deny me. Uh, I wonder if Pastor Kim, I wonder if you'd pray for me. Bro. Help me. I need help. Heavenly Father, uh, not just the streets, but even the pulpit in everyday life, I pray yep. that we feel like we're in a panic. So God, Holy Spirit, you move in now. You move in now and take control. Will you have us hear what you want us to hear in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, I want to talk about this rooster uh, here. The, uh, Jesus said uh, the, the cock's not going to crow uh, three times before you deny me, Peter. And uh, Lord kind of put his hand on that rooster, and uh, this is a gospel rooster. Uh, uh, God uses animals, and uh, I don't know if you know it or not, but uh, if you read your Bible, the Lord used lice, and he used flies, and he used, um, what else there, all, all that stuff over there in, in Egypt land over there, used those things. Uh, to convince Pharaoh that they ought to let the people of children of Israel go. Um, here's, um, uh, we got uh, uh, Jonah and the whale. God used the whale, you know, and uh, he swallowed up Jonah and took him off there somewhere. He got Balaam's ass. It always tickles me, you know, these guys are so holy. Uh, they read the, they, uh, I've read this uh, reading all the time. And he's, he's uh, this fundamentalist pastor, and he's talking about Balaam's ass. And then the very next chapter, the very next line, he says, uh, uh, the donkey. Well, it ain't a donkey, it's an ass. Right. And the Bible said it was Balaam's ass. Anyway, uh, God opened up his mouth. I mean, how, you know, how mad must Balaam have been uh, uh, when the jackass is stinking talking back to him, and he's arguing with the jackass. I mean, he thought about it. I, I can just, uh, uh, there's no shock on his part that this is a jackass talking to me. He just got all upset. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if you ever thought much about it. I, I'm old enough now uh, where uh, I remember they had um, uh, uh, Francis, the talking mule. Any of y'all remember him? Francis. Oh, oh man, I am old. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Okay. You, you win the uh, free chicken. Um, but uh, uh, they had Francis goes into the army, uh, Francis, uh, you know, in Hawaii, and here's this talking mule. You, uh, some of y'all might remember Mr. Ed. That came out of, out of Balaam's ass right here. Hollywood's got nothing to offer you. They get everything that they get out of that their Bible. But this is a, um, this is a gospel uh, rooster. Uh, God used a raven to feed Elijah down there. And, and, and it's not shouldn't be an unusual thing for you to think that God would use a rooster. Uh, this is a well-known story uh, about a rooster that really got into the ministry. I mean, preacher, he got ordained and had hands laid on him and uh, got baptized, and this rooster got into the ministry. Um, he was uh, called to preach. And uh, God uh, set him apart and sanctified him and filled him with the Holy Ghost uh, so that he could do his job and crow just at the right time. And I want you to, uh, with me, I won't be long. In a, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> we all say that, don't we? What is it, man? We all say that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, but I want you to look with me, and I want, to know, I want you to notice some things with me about this rooster, and we'll try to make some application in my life and in your life. And I want to, I want to say, first of all, about this rooster, is that uh, he did what he could. Uh, brethren, he just did what he could. 
And uh, he didn't try to bark like a dog. Uh, he didn't try to sing like a canary. Uh, he, he got going there, and uh, he, he didn't try to roar like a lion. Uh, he did what he could do. Now, in this room, there are a large number of people with different personalities. You cannot be Pastor Kim. You cannot be this preacher. You cannot be Dr. Ruckman. Believe it or not, just because you read everything that he's got, you cannot be Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. And uh, brother, you have a personality. And one of the hardest things that you'll ever have to do in this life is just to be yourself. And just let God use you. That's all, that's all that it takes, brother. Uh, this rooster did what he could do. And God said that he gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets, and he gave some teachers and preachers, and uh, for the perfecting of the saints. Listen, we're not uh, following some cunningly devised set of rules somewhere, say that you've got to act like some people talk, no, some preachers talk quietly, some people get excited. I like getting excited. That's just what I do. I like it. And uh, if I don't get excited, I get upset. I, get, uh, I want to do that. Uh, but it's for the perfecting of the saints. And you talk to one guy, and he says something, and it do doesn't sink in. You talk to another guy, and he says the exact same thing, but, and God uses that and pierces your heart. And the way that he said it was different than him, but it, it, it helped you. And somebody forgot along the line somewhere, some preacher forgot that the preachers are supposed to help people. We're supposed to help people. And it's not just kicking you around the bus. Sometimes you need it. Sometimes you need a good spanking. But for the most part, we're trying to help you. We want you to uh, uh, love God. Uh, and uh, so this rooster here, he did uh, what he could do. Uh, I want to say, secondly, that his job, crowing, uh, was not considered important by the world. Uh, his job wasn't considered important. Um, brother, you, some of you people, you, you go out here on the street, uh, some of you teach a Sunday school class, uh, some of you all are, are into the nursery or nursing home or whatever your ministry might be for God, uh, this world out here couldn't care less. It's just not important to them. They don't love you, and that's why church is so important. And if you're not going to church somewhere, bless God, you need to get into a church somewhere. I mean, I, I know, you know, you want to be the big shot and things like that, but uh, listen, take the, take the low seat. Get down. Say, well, I don't like being on the last rung of the ladder. So, well, at least you're on the ladder. What do you care? And uh, you're down there. I, uh, uh, my friend, uh, Buddy Cargill, he used to tell me, he said, Jack, I don't have to be the star of the show. And I know that I will never be the star of the show. Uh, but brethren, uh, I, I, I want to put my two cents in. I want to be part of Joe Banana and the bunch. I, I want to be in the crowd that's going God's way. And whether I'm noticed or not noticed or take the back seat or the middle seat or whatever it is, bless God, hallelujah, uh, I'm in the crowd. I'm in the bunch. I'm in the bunch that God loves and God loves you. God cares about you. God is happy to take you up to heaven one day. Man, we're going. I'm going. I want to thank you, Lord, for the liberty that I feel here right now. His job was not considered important. Uh, his crowing was just a common thing. And uh, his little bit was uh, just usually unnoticed by uh, people. His crowing seemed stupid. I, uh, I oh, well, okay. Uh, First Corinthians said the preaching of the cross uh, is to them that perish foolishness. And this rooster's uh, crowing didn't it, it just wasn't considered important at all i hate chickens i, I hate them uh, i had a, a country boy when i first got saved i was going to a little uh, well anyway and he was fighting chickens and so i 
he said, here, hold this chicken. And that dirty dog, he, it took uh, and pecked me right there. It took me about a month to get over that. I didn't think I'd ever get it. He got me really bad. But when I went to Bible school, did I tell you I hate chickens? When I, when I went to Bible school, um, uh, my wife and I were living in a um, shotgun house. It used to be a corn crib. And the man that I rented from, Mr. Wise, uh, he had uh, guinea hens and he had peacocks. This is in Florida. And uh, he had um, roosters and he had chickens. And that there's something mentally wrong with that rooster that was in his uh, hen house. That thing crowed. I thought they were supposed to like 6 o'clock in the morning crow. This thing crowed. I don't know. I'm city boy. Uh, and I thought, I got my ideas about country people, but, but this was this stupid thing. He went off all night long, all night, all night. And uh, see, I might not sound like a bad deal to you, but after you go to work, I had to get up and go to work, and then I get off at 6 or 5.30, something like that, and then you go to Bible school, and you're there until 10 o'clock at night, and then you got to, uh, go home and mess with that stupid Greek. <laughs> Try to make sense of that stuff. You know? um, and when I laid my head on my pillow, I wanted to go to sleep. And this stupid thing uh, was going crowing all night long. And um, I don't know how I got on this, but uh, <laughs> but I told my wife, I said, I'm going to kill that rooster. <laughs> I hate that rooster. She said, oh, honey, Mr. Wise, you know, he's so nice to us. And... Uh, so I got, I went in there one time, and there was the, the hen house, and he was in there, and I ran in there real quick, and all the roost, all the chickens ran in through this hole, and he got his head in there, but I got his feet, and I, and I was pulling on him, and I was trying to get him out of there, and I mean, I was tugging, and he was, he was making, was not, I could not pull him out of that hole. I don't know what had a hold of it. So I had to leave, and I went and got me a pellet gun. <laughs> and I, I told my wife, I'm killing him. <laughs> and I was in the military. I was in the Army. The, Mr. Wise lived over here. Right across the street, there was some guy that was watching me. I know he was watching me. And, uh, but I was in the military, so I knew how to do the low crawl. I got down, <laughs> and I got that pellet gun. Crawled up there to a little bank right there where there was some grass, and I shot that joker, man. I mean, it was like foghorn leghorn, boy. His feet went up in the air. <laughs> and, uh, and then I felt bad, you know, because I killed him. And, uh, but I went in, and I took him, and I, Mr. Wise had some feed sacks, and I stuck him in there, and we drove down the road, and I threw him off there somewhere. And then after that, I, I had a good night's sleep. But... Uh, <laughs> But, did I tell you I hate chickens, man? I just don't, I don't like them. Uh, thirdly, I want to say this, he wasn't ashamed. He wasn't ashamed. You understand? His crowing, he crowed all the time. I mean, it's a gospel rooster, brother. He really was. Um, his, he crowed before everybody. He wasn't ashamed. He didn't care. Uh, if I came in their place trying to kill him or anything. He crowed. His crowing didn't embarrass him. And brethren, you might not be the best preacher in town. You might not be the best street preacher. You might not be the best Sunday school teacher, but brethren, you're in the game. And you're doing the best that you can do. And just because people don't think you're the best, God's got a seat somewhere and He's got you in the fight. So hang in there, brother. You're doing something for God. And what you're doing for God is important. He wouldn't have you in there. He wouldn't have that for you. Uh, he wasn't ashamed. And don't, don't be ashamed. Uh, I, I feel like i got to talk all the time. And I, I work real hard at just shutting my mouth and not saying anything. I really do. Because I just feel like i just got to talk. Thank you, brother. <laughs> and... Um, I want people to like me. I guess that's a, a, a fault. Uh, but, um, brother, you go out here uh, on the street, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can preach. And thank God, just don't preach too long. 
I hate it when I go out with these people and they preach for an hour, two hours, and you know, you're standing there waiting for your turn. Excuse me, stupid. Other people are called to preach too. I wouldn't mind having my turn. Can I have my turn? You know. And, uh, and I like that. But look, if you can't preach, my wife goes out with me, and I got to hold her down sometimes. She likes to preach too. Uh, but uh, she doesn't preach. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but she passes out tracks. Passing out tracks, uh, folks, is probably one of the more valuable things that you can do because they take that and they go home with it. And I've heard some amazing stories about gospel tracks. Maybe you have too. Uh, we have banners. You can hold a banner. Uh, don't be embarrassed uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Um, come up with some... Uh, quips or some sharp things to say back to people. Um, I don't know, you guys know what Mad Magazine is? You ever heard of that? They get, boy, I'm getting old. <laughs> Mad Magazine, they had, I was one of my favorite magazines. And in Mad Magazine, uh, they had a couple of spy versus spy, and, and they, they were always going at it, the good guy and the bad guy. But they had another section in there called... Uh, Happy answers to stupid questions. And uh, as a child of God, and as a street preacher, as a Christian, I've tried to come up with some snappy answers to stupid questions. And you'll get plenty of them out on the street. I'll just give you one, and don't, don't get, we're all adults here, okay? Uh, I'm not going to be offensive on purpose. Uh, but, um, you know, people like to give you a, a finger, <clears throat> right? Everybody knows what that means. And uh, I had a few of them. Uh, but um, somebody gives that, lifts that finger up to you. Here's a couple things you can say to them. Yeah, I got five of those. You know, <laughs> <laughs> my all-time favorite. These are snappy answers to stupid questions. Uh, they give you the finger, and they're walking across the street. Encourage them. I said, oh, man, look at that. Isn't that? Hold it high, honey. Hold it up high. That's right. I'd be proud of my IQ, too. Hold it up there. <laughs> Man, I ought to learn something after 40 years on the street, even if it's just that. <laughs> but he wasn't ashamed. And I want to say, too, brethren, he was faithful. Uh, the Bible said that, um, moreover, it's required in roosters that uh, he become, that he be faithful. And brethren, if it's true for roosters, it'll all be true for us. And God doesn't bless success as much as he blesses. You know that. You've heard messages about that. God likes faithfulness. And whether you feel like it or not, go participate in some ministry uh, for the Lord. Uh, he crowed when he was supposed to crow. And uh, can you imagine, I mean, it was actually prophesied by Jesus Christ that this guy would perk up and crow. Uh, you know, after uh, Peter denied him, and he did his job, he got up. Are you doing your job? Uh, don't don't be afraid to, to work for God. I think uh, the average Christian doesn't think he's capable of doing anything. Uh, you look at these preachers here that know dispensations and can run it down to you. You look at these uh, preachers here that got the guts to step, and it takes guts, brethren, to step out into, a, uh, into an area, especially like this, and try to start a church, man, that takes guts. And uh, you guys, God bless you, man. I tell you, I got all the respect in the world for you. I think you got to be a paranoid schizophrenic to want to be a pastor these days. I thank God I don't pastor a church anymore. You ought to pray for your preachers, pray for your pastors, brother. You don't know what they're up against. You, you can't know. You're not supposed to know. And um, just pray for them. And God would help them and be a blessing to them. Um, his job just wasn't considered important. He wasn't ashamed. Uh, and he was faithful, uh, brethren. He crowed uh, in rain. He crowed in the sunshine. And he crowed. He just crowed when he was supposed to. Uh, the Bible said to preach the word. Amen. Uh, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove them, rebuke them, exhort them, help them. Man, they need help. You understand? I'm not. Um, 
I, I got to tell you, I, I, I had a struggle with this because I'll be really honest with you, I just don't care if somebody don't take Christ or not. And I want to tell you, God is not up in heaven bawling his eyes out because somebody re won't receive Jesus Christ. Um, I get out there, I'm telling people the truth out here. On If you want truth, I've got it. Trouble with Americans is they don't want it anymore. They're out, what they want is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's what they want, those three things. And if they got that, they think their life is happy. They think they got it, uh, they got it going on. Um, the Bible said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And we're in that time now. Uh, you imagine that Philadelphia church period and somebody sneezed and uh, they got saved or something. I mean, man, it was just you, just, you just went out there and preached, man. And uh, everybody was getting saved. Uh, I saw some pictures, J. Frank Norris. He got 50,000 people. In a, can you imagine 50,000 people sitting there to listen to you preach? How would you like it? <laughs> and that'd be wonderful. Um, but here we are. Where do we find ourselves here in 2018, going into 19? Uh, Laodicea, brother, here we are. Philadelphia church period is over. I don't care how good a preacher you are. You are not going to get a crowd in 2019 unless God does something. So here we are in Laodicea. And everybody wants, you know, the rights of the people. Boy, I want this and I want that. And I'm going to get that. Now, don't tell me about God. And um, uh, look who he's got. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You say, man, I hate Laodicea. Hey, look, man, look who he's got here. <laughs> what a bunch of losers. <laughs> we are, brother. We are. But I'm a loser for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I, I, don't, I don't mind being a loser for the Lord. Let me see where I am on this paper. i got to stay with this paper here. Uh, I want to say, too, that his job, this rooster's job, was not popular. Uh, he woke people up. <laughs> uh, I, I don't really, uh, well, I won't say that. Um, his job was to crow as loud as he could so that Peter could hear him. He woke people up in the morning, just like that guy over my place. Uh, his job sometimes made people mad. Um, John, over in John 16, said that uh, they're going to put you out of the synagogue. And John said, yea, the time will come when they, when they kill you, they'll think that they're doing God's service. One of the biggest irritations, aggravations to me on the street, the three biggest problematic people that I have are number one, Muslims, as far as religion and peace, you know, uh, and, uh, and then homosexuals, that's another violent group, and then uh, Christians who just don't like the way you're doing it, that's all. You're not doing it right. And man, I can't, every time I go on a college campus, here they come, man, I, I, they act like I've never heard this before. <laughs> and uh, it's the same thing over and over and over again. And I uh, I finally had to come up with something. I, I, t I tell them this. I said, look, I know you don't like this style of evangelism, and I don't like yours, uh, but um, why don't we think about working with these people here? And what I mean, I'm going to stand up here, and I'm going to preach. I'm not going to quit preaching the way I'm preaching. I'm going to preach this way, and sometimes we get a crowd, sometimes we don't. Uh, but when I leave, everybody's going to come to you and say, man, did you hear that guy? Good night, man. He must hate everybody. Well, hey, that gives you uh, the opportunity to turn it around. Uh, you know, can you handle it from there? And, and uh, can, you, can you come on and talk to somebody about Jesus Christ? Or have you got to buy him an ice cream cone? So that's the way these guys are, this lifestyle evangelism. That's what he's telling me. And I said, look, chief. I don't have enough money to take everybody out for a meal. <laughs> and, uh, so I get out there. Why in the world? Man, I could preach to five. I could, we go to these events, brother. They're everywhere. And we use amplification, get to talk to these people. Uh, he never got discouraged. Uh, he never even looked for encouragement, this rooster. 
He just he wanted to crow. He liked crowing. And uh, when it came time to crow, he was happy to crow. And when it's time to go preaching, brother, I love to preach. There ain't nothing. What preacher in here don't like to preach? You know, cut it out, man. That's what I'm saying. You called to preach, man. You chomping, snorting, and stomping, wanting to preach. And that's just the way we are. Good or bad, you know, we like to preach. He never got discouraged. His crowing was a lonely job. No other rooster is around, and God called on him to crow. You don't need a crowd, brethren. You just need an okay from God. And he's already given it to you uh, in a King James Bible. He told you to go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. Um, look, brethren, we, we have a tendency to relegate preaching uh, to an anointed few. You got a, a pastor. You have a evangelist, you have a missionary. That ain't just to them, brethren. It's, it's to all of God's people. And you go out there, I, I, I sometimes get around some people and uh, they got women, I mean, you know, you go out there and you, you're preaching. And I've heard um, uh, women preachers, I'm going to tell you the truth, man, they're pretty good. And uh, got me under conviction. Uh, I went to a charismatic church. I, I didn't know it was char charismatic. But I got invited to preach and I went to this charismatic church and I uh, found out they were charismatic. <laughs> but after I got done preaching, after I got done preaching, uh, my wife is not doing real good. She's kind of sick. And um, uh, I went and sat down and the pastor got up like uh, like Brother Pastor here does. What's your name? Uh, Kim, yeah. Um, <laughs> Like he does, and pastors are good at that, drawing the message together and stuff. And they're given an invitation. And he stood up and said, now, anybody got any uh, prayer requests? You got any prayer requests? <laughs> and uh, it was just a small church. And, um, and I said, yeah. I said, uh, preacher, I'd like you to pray for my wife. You know, she ain't doing real good. And uh, <clears throat> you know what Baptists do, but, you know. You know, you tell them you got a problem. You're Baptist, right? Everybody Baptist? You know what we do. I'll pray for you, brother. <laughs> right? Hey, I just got to wonder if, yeah, we'll pray for you, brother. <laughs> um, but he said, and I, and I told him, I said, you know, she's got this problem. I said, I wonder if you just pray for her. And uh, he said, sure, brother. And every woman in that church, there was probably 25, 30 people in that church, Every woman in that church uh, came up to my wife, and they were crying when they got up there. And I thought, "Oh God, I wish we could. Uh, I wish we had more of this." And they uh, they came up and laid their hands on her. Man, I was bawling. <laughs> and my wife was bawling, and they were all crying. And they just laid their hands on my wife, and they prayed for her. And I thought, uh, "God, man, give me some of that." I don't want the rest of it, but give me some of that, yeah, you know, right. amen. <laughs> uh, brethren, let me, let me try to bring this down and, uh, uh, here. Uh, he never got discouraged. Uh, I want to say he was never patted on the back. Uh, you're not, you'll get your pat on the back up there, brother. And uh, when you get up there and stand in front of God, uh, all these people that turn your tracks down, you know what we are out here on the street, brethren? We are life unto life and death unto death. And uh, I think that's the way Paul said it. Is that right? Um, but we give somebody a track. That's life. If you'll take this thing and act on it, you can go to heaven. You, you can know Jesus Christ. And, uh, uh, and if you turn it down, honestly, I tell them I, I preach it, man. No skin off my nose. I'm going to heaven. I, I pay, I, you know, Jesus Christ paid the price on Calvary's cross for me. And when he hung on the tree, uh, my sins were nailed to his body on the tree. And when he died, I'm, I, he paid the entire penalty of an eternity in hell for me. And thank God, that's the best thing I ever did in my life. And pardon, I'm just going to tell you, if you don't want it, then it's on your head. And I'm out here to tell you the truth, and I hope to God you get saved. I'll do anything I can do to save. But if you don't want it, then run along, Sonny, because there's other people out here that might just want it. Don't stand there and give me a hard time. 
Paul said, at my first answer, no man stood with me. He said, but uh, all men forsook me. And I pray God that it wouldn't be. See that, that love there? Everybody forsook me. They all left me. But I pray God, you know, praying for them. I want to help them. Well, let me see what else I got here. I got one more. Uh, I want to say this, that he did his job well. He did it good. He did the best he could. And brother, that's all God expects out of us. You don't have to be a Pastor Kim. You don't have to be a Dr. Ruffman. All you have to be is yourself. And use the personality that God gave you. And tell the truth about the Bible. And tell the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he crowed at the right time. He did what he was supposed to do. He crowed so that Simon uh, Peter uh, could hear him. And so, brethren, here this morning, why don't you be like that rooster? Look, his job wasn't popular. You're, you're not going to be, you know, president of the United States. What a joke. Any child can be president. Yeah. <laughs> you ever got $14 million to throw into a campaign? Uh, he didn't get discouraged. Uh, he did what he could. Uh, brethren, this morning, would you do what you can? It, maybe you can't do everything. You know, I don't know if people crippled up in different ways, emotionally, physically. Would you just do what you can do for God? That, that's all that he, he wants out of you. Um, where have I got this? Uh, I had a guy call me, and he went up to uh, someplace, Massachusetts or Boston. Uh, is George Whitfield's church up there? Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm talking about either. <laughs> um, but I, anyway, he called me up and he said he walked. Now I preach this message at his church. And he called me and he said, Jack, I just was up at George Whitfield's church. And he said, you're not going to believe it. When you walk out of his church and walk out, uh, back out onto the pavement and you look up, there's a great big rooster up there. <laughs> Uh, on the uh, up there on the uh, on the corner up there. So, brethren, do the best you can. All right. Cock-a-doodle-doo. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>